Now it is time to turn to our guest. Um, I'm very happy to have join us, uh, Natalia Guerrero, to talk about worlds beyond our own, new discoveries from NASA's test mission um, here at All Space Considered. So um, first of all, welcome, Natalia. So welcome to have you here. And thank you for hanging in here with us. As, as is our style, we are running late again tonight, folks. So we're gonna go well beyond nine o'clock because we're gonna give you a chance to hear from uh, Natalia. Um, you are the um, Object of Interest Manager at MIT. Um, you're at the MIT Kavli Institute there working with TESS. And that means you get to deal with sort of all of those objects that TESS is observing and figure out which of them could be exoplanets or might be candidates for it. So you're the one that has your finger right on that pulse. Um, in addition, <laughs> just published a paper that had like 100 authors on it. It was crazy long. Um, and it was literally the first release of saying, hey, here are these candidates. And it wasn't just one or two. I'm not gonna tell the number, I'm gonna let you tell that because it'll be fun. But I do wanna say, we prepared something special for you here at All Space Considered, um, just to show uh, what we think is sort of, could be used to sort of inspire you out on your mission. We built you a hovercraft, um, the Exoplanet Explorer hovercraft, and you're out there, you're, it's you versus the biggest problem in the world. And you're solving it there out in space um, with the test mission and you're getting it done. So I hope you're, you're pleased by what we've done for you here at All Space Considered. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Natalia, take it away. It's all you from here on out. And we'll ask some questions once you're done. I love it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is amazing. Oh, I can see. Oh, this is really great. I love it. Well, we'll so have, well we, we are happy to send you a copy. And there is a story behind that, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you all figure it out on your own. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is great. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for hosting me. Um, I am part of the test science office at MIT in Cambridge. And oh, got my laser pointer going. Uh, so I work uh, here. This is the campus of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And more specifically, I work here in this office that has a really nice view of MIT's dome. And um, I work in the um, MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics, but specifically on the TESS mission. So TESS studies something called exoplanets. So exoplanets are planets that are outside our solar system. So we have the eight, not nine, planets in our own solar system, but we now know of thousands of exoplanets outside of our, outside of ours. And so this is really exciting because we didn't know about this 30 years ago. This is something that has happened in just the last several decades. And so why is this important? Why do we care? Uh, if we look at our own solar system, we can start to try to put together a pattern. We have a handful of small rocky planets towards the inside, close to our host star. And then as we move further out, we see that we have gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn. And then as we move further out, we also have ice giants. And then we, as we get even further out, we have these low brightness, rocky objects again. So we have this configuration and we know what kind of star our sun is, but we know that there's billions of stars in our galaxy and a lot of them are much larger than our sun or much smaller, different temperatures, different clustering, different ages. So there must be a different or maybe similar. Um, there's a lot of questions about how do systems form of exoplanets? So that's one question that we're trying to answer by studying exoplanets. Another for folks who care a little bit more about what's under our feet is how unique is Earth? So we have all of these amazing spacecraft that we've talked about tonight um, that are all trained on Earth, trying to understand our atmosphere, our um, interactions with coronal mass ejections, um, and Earth is really a special place to live. We have water, we have land, we have a magnetic field. And we have, I really like this picture. This was actually taken from one of the Apollo missions. Um, we have this really beautiful, thin, very, very thin, but very critical atmosphere that has clouds and water, oxygen, all of the critical things that we need for life. 
And we know from because we live here that Earth is a, a really special place to be. But what about all of these other exoplanets that we're now discovering? What are they like? How, what is their story? How did they form? And this leads me to, I think, the question that is stirs the most imagination and creativity. Are we alone? Is there another planet like Earth, another system that looks just like our solar system? And what does the search for life look like? Is like, what are we, are we looking for an atmosphere that looks like ours? Is this something completely different? So this question of are we alone, I think pulls at my heartstrings for sure. And I think it, it really does motivate the study for um, planets around other stars. So what have we done to actually find these planets? So back in 2009, the paradigm of studying exoplanets really took off and accelerated. Before this space telescope, Kepler, which was shown here in the foreground, before about 2009 when it launched, we knew of maybe a few hundred exoplanets that had been discovered by some previous space-based telescopes, but also ground-based telescopes at observatories all over the world. But then with Kepler, Kepler stared kind of like a pencil beam at one tiny patch of sky and said, okay, I'm gonna look here and I'm gonna try and count up all of the exoplanets in this patch and do a census. And Kepler found thousands. And from those thousands, we were able to extrapolate something really fundamental. The exoplanets are common, they're commonplace. And that means that for the billions of stars in our galaxy, there's likely billions of exoplanets. And this is a really huge takeaway that Kepler gave us, that we are surrounded by this exoplanetary family. And since then, we've been able to devote many more resources to characterizing exoplanets to try and find out where in this family tree Earth belongs. We found that there are planets that we've been able to match up to the ones in our own solar system, but there's also planets that look nothing like Earth. So there's super Earths that are maybe one and a half to two times the size of Earth or a little bit smaller. There's also a really unique type of planet that we haven't been able to find in our own solar system, mini Neptunes that are smaller than Neptune. Neptune is about four times the size of Earth for, rep for reference and giant planets. Planets that are even bigger than Jupiter. And so we are starting to figure this out. And also we've been able to look at protoplanetary disks, the big sort of um, hula hoop tutu of matter that is surrounding stars. And that's what planets pull themselves together from. And so we're starting to figure out where we've come from, where we're going. And I work on this really amazing little spacecraft called TESS that has been able to continue this search. Um, and how does TESS do it? So TESS is a mission that uses the transit method. So it uses the same method that Kepler does. We're not directly taking a picture of the exoplanet because the star is thousands of times brighter. It's so much brighter. But what TESS does is it's able to measure the amount of light blocked by the planet as it transits or crosses in front of the star. So a big planet will make a big transit and a small planet will make a small dip. So that's what's shown in this light curve, this plot of brightness over time. And so we're able to back out from that, the planet's relative size compared to its star and how close it is to its host star. So if we know about the star's temperature, we're able to figure out about how much radiation, how much energy is reaching the planet. And we can start making rough estimates as to whether or not the planet is in the habitable zone of its host star, meaning whether or not it's able to sustain liquid water on its surface. So here I have a schematic of a theoretical exoplanet system with a bunch of planets orbiting its host star. And so as we launch this into motion, we can see that some of these planets are in its habitable zone. They're able to sustain liquid water on their surface. And then some of them are too far out. You may have also heard of this as the Goldilocks zone and for similar reasons, like the, the, the story said, some are too hot and some are too cold and some are just right. And so Tess has actually been able to find a planet in the habitable zone. Um, early in 2020, Tess found a new exoplanet called um, 
TOI 700D, which is not really a super memorable name. And there we go. It is part of a three planet system. Um, this was around a small reddish star, um, smaller than our Earth. And the planet is about 1.2 times the size of Earth. And it's right here at the very inner edge of the habitable zone for this host star. And its um, period is less than 40 days. So its year happens a little over one and a half times a month. So imagine that having a birthday that often, be a lot of birthday cake. <laughs> so this is just one example of a system that Tess has been able to give us this picture of that we've been able to go after with uh, ground-based telescopes and also with space-based telescopes like Spitzer, for example, before Spitzer retired. So, um, but let me give you also the big picture of what TESS has been doing. So TESS has been mapping the sky over the course of two years. First, it started on the Southern Hemisphere and then it flipped over after a year and looked at the Northern Hemisphere. And so it looked at each one of these sections for about 27 days each and it has been filling this in. We, once we did this in our first two years, we launched in 2018, we've gone back and looked at the Southern Hemisphere again. We're almost done with that. So at the end of June, we're gonna be turning back around and looking at the Northern Hemisphere. And this is really exciting because whereas Kepler, I said, was really focused on just one patch of sky, Tess is looking at the whole sky and trying to find where are there exoplanets around bright stars that are relatively nearby and where are small, do, can we find small exoplanets around those stars? So let me give you a little picture of what we've actually found in comparison to what we already knew from Kepler. So here I've shown our test map of all of the sky that we've managed to image with tests. And on top of it, I've shown in these yellow dots, all of the transiting planets from other surveys. The big blob here at the top, let me pull out my handy laser pointer. Up here, this is all found by the Kepler mission. And then these sort of clusters here are the different campaigns, the fields looked at by K2. So thousands of planets pulled out of this mission and other missions like it. And then I'm gonna wipe those off the board and just draw the TESS um, planet candidates on there. So we've been able to cover the whole sky by going section by section, sector by sector. And in three years, we've been able to find over 2,500 planet candidates. And as we continue to look both at the Southern sky and at the Northern sky, we're gonna be looking, we're gonna try and fill in some of these gaps and also look along the ecliptic. So we'll be overlapping the Kepler field and the K2 field, which I'm really excited about. And um, we're going to be adding to the number of exoplanets we know. And in my head, I, this, this ends up being like a to-do list to me because there's all of these individual planets that have their own story. And then they all belong to a larger population of planets. And then we're putting together this huge family tree like that picture I showed at the beginning. So there's a lot of work to do um, it's really exciting. There's a lot of new people coming on board. It's a rapidly growing community and I'm, I'm really excited to see what TESS does next. Well, that is some amazing, amazing stuff you've got going on there. Um, now, you said there's over 2,500, 2,600 candidates so far, but your paper only had whatever, 2,200. Are you breaking news here live and all things <laughs> considered, announcing that there's another few hundred that are gonna be coming soon? Yes, yeah, so Tess, actually the catalog of planet candidates is alive and we're always adding candidates to it. So we host this publicly online in a number of places. One is actually not that far down the street from the observatory or maybe it is depending on traffic, but um, uh, Caltech IPAC um, hosts the Exoplanet Archive and um, the follow-up program there. So those are where, that's one of the places where a catalog appears. And so we actually go through with a team of people. And once the data has passed through our pipelines and our analysis and a bunch of filters, we look at the top 
couple hundred candidates or so from each new data set with a team of really amazing people. And we say, okay, these are the ones that we think are planet candidates. And so basically once or twice a week, we'll release half a dozen, a dozen new candidates. And those are picked up immediately mm -hmm. by telescopes all around the world. And a whole team of follow-up observers leaps into action and goes and observes those and starts the process of, of discovering new planets. Well, that's, that, that's just awesome. We've been covering exoplanets here at All Space Considered really the whole time we've been doing it. It's some of my favorite stuff, but to hear it from you, someone that's doing it on the ground, have your hands in the research is, is just great fun. In fact, our crowd over at our YouTube chat have been asking some questions. Um, one person wanted to know, are there any anything new with the TRAPPIST system? And is the TRAPPIST system going to be one of the ones you'll be able to, um, to observe? Do you, do you have any news on it? So that's a good question. Um, TRAPPIST is around, I think it's around, it orbits an M type star. And so yeah. it's, TESS is really, um, its cameras are sensitive to the red air wavelength. So we're really excited about M type stars. Um, mm -hmm. And often the planets around those stars, if they're close in and small, it's a lot easier for us to detect because small planet, small star, but the, the dip is big. So yeah, yeah for the um, folks that don't know, the TRAPPIST system has seven candidates and I think four of them are within the habitable zone. So it's yeah, a yeah. super interesting system that we've reported on before at Allspace, but um, it sounds like you don't have any data to, to tell us about just yet, but TESS is designed to look at exactly that type of star though. Exactly. So that, that is, that's amazing. Another question we had, someone wanted to know um, what percentage of the sky will be covered by the end of the second pass? But I really think you're on to year three, um, but you said you're gonna fill in almost all of it, but that chunk of the galactic center, that's the big block over there that you're not gonna look at. Are you not going to observe there or will that also be filled in eventually? So we are going to cover that. Uh, we're going to cover up part of that. I think I have a picture that shows where that's going to show up. Um, but we're going to go from having covered 70% of the night sky to 88% of the night sky. Yeah. Okay, just fascinating. Now, it, now, keep in mind, everybody, that this is not as deep of a survey. Uh, Kepler stared at one patch a very, very long time. So TESS is designed to pick up exoplanets that would be around nearby stars is going to look at almost all of them within all these patches. So it's super exciting to sort of get, you know, a distance limited sample. It really lets you see what the truth is out there. So the, this is just a wonderful mission. Um, it adds to our knowledge of what Kepler does. So what are we seeing here? This is a one you've brought up. Yes, so we have the, the year one and year two test image underneath and then you can see that our third year has basically tried to reobserve and fill in some of the little tiny gaps in our first year of observation down here in the south. Um, but then in the north, what I was talking about before is we're going to go back to some of our northern sectors. Um, we're going to try and fill in some of these gaps. We weren't able to observe those initially and again are going to be challenged by scattered light from the earth that contaminates the the test cameras and makes it hard to get good um, photometry good measurements of the mm. brightness of stars um, but then we're going to turn tests on its side and look at the ecliptic plane and we're going to be able to see uh, some of the the kepler the k2 campaigns there so I'm, I'm really excited for those because yeah. there's going to be a lot of stars in those cameras. Yeah, I was going to say, what in particular are you, are you excited about um, comparing how the two look or what about using the two data sets together excites you? I'm really interested in seeing, um, it's been really great seeing planets that we saw the first time around, a second time around and checking in with them two, year, two years later. It's like a celebrity is like, where are they now? Um, <laughs> and because we're able to get a better idea of how often they go around their host star, we're able to measure them more precisely. Um, but especially with the ecliptic, it's going to be about um, not only exoplanets, but also um, there's just so much happening in the ecliptic plane. And one of the things that TESS has actually been really good for and that's emerging from TESS is being able to find asteroid tracks. I don't know if you knew about this. No. Um, no, but... tell, tell us about asteroid tracks. Yeah, so asteroids um, are kind of bright. 
um, especially if you stack a bunch of images together, they just pop out. Um, but you can see them move from image to image because test takes images every 10 minutes right now in the extended mission. So in year four, you're going to have basically a, a 10 minute time lapse essentially of like one frame every 10 minutes for a month. And so you can, you can track an asteroid that way and figure out its velocity and things. And there's so many in the ecliptic. So this could be a great data set for teams that are interested in asteroids, in confirming asteroids found by other spacecraft like Neowise. It's, so I think that's one of my favorite things is that TESS is really amazing for exoplanets, but it's also this really powerful tool for all sorts of other astronomy and astrophysics. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was one of our questions. Um, can you characterize briefly, this was from Carolyn Collins Peterson, uh, can you characterize briefly the non-exoplanet objects TESS has seen? I know yeah. that it's seen some supernovae, but anything else? And what about those supernovae it's finding? Um, I can talk about, uh, we've also been able to observe a tidal disruption event. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it was called Assassin 19KO. But um, essentially, it's this massive star that is going around the center of its galaxy. And the center is a black hole. And so every time it whips around, the galaxy snatches a bite of the outer shell of this giant star. And um, that creates all this energy. And some of that is given off as this huge flare of light that we can measure from here on Earth. And you can measure other things in other wavelengths. But Tess is interested in the light. And because this is an orbit, it's predictable. And so this was known about. And we realized, oh, hey, we're going to be able to observe this with Tess. And so TESS was able to contribute a really high quality um, light curve to the, the multi-wavelength data set for, for this tidal disruption event. It was really cool. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, Tad, Tad Daly wants to know, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Tad. Um, if TESS were at the right location, would it be able to see planets orbiting our own sun? He wanted to know if it would see nine objects. And I think that would be unlikely, Tad, only because Pluto's orbit's quite tilted. Um, and Pluto's really, really, really small. So it's not going to block out much light at all. You'd see our moon long before you'd see Pluto. But would you be able to see planets around our own sun if you were in the right location with, with a, a spacecraft like TESS? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so TESS is always pointed away from the sun and it's orbiting the earth and it's trying to balance, its orbit is balanced with, um, it's in resonance with the moon. And so we've actually gotten a little bit of Mars in the field of view of TESS. Um, we weren't planning on that, um, but it ended up being a really good test of, Mars is super bright in the TESS um, <laughs> cameras. And so that was, Yes, like you don't want Mars in. Okay. You, we're trying to avoid planets. Um, well, I think I think Tad wanted to know, say, if, if an alien civilization, say on Proxima Centauri, were looking back at our own sun, and if it were in the ecliptic, I don't think Proxima Centauri is in the ecliptic. So anyway, a star in the ecliptic. Chris, you probably know which stars are in the ecliptic better Pollux, than I do, or Patrick. Sure. Um, Pollux is in the ecliptic? Close. Close. Anyway, so a star in the ecliptic, um, so we'd be looking back towards the sun and our own planets would transit from that view, perhaps. Would Tess be able to see that from a nearby star? Um, we'd have to get pretty lucky. <laughs> okay, so not all, not all stars are going to, you have to plan it. So the orientation has to be just so. But if yes. it were just so, I, I think Tess could see um, Earth and, and probably, uh, I would guess, Venus, Earth, certainly Jupiter, certainly Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. But again, you got to get lucky. They have to cross. So yeah, um, yeah. most of the time, the, the object's just going to go around the star, and Tess is going to be blind to it. You need other techniques. So it's some small fraction. It's a few percent of the stars have that orientation just right. But yeah, anyway, yeah. That, that's another story. Let's see what else that we have here from our, our folks. Um, uh, have we seen a planet like Hoth? So sort of from the Star, <laughs> the Star Wars universe, the frozen planet of Hoth from Empire Strikes Back. Are there any frozen worlds out there you think that are on the far edge of the habitable zone that we've seen? I can't think of any right off the bat, but I know we have found some that are too cold. 
-hmm. And Kepler definitely did because there, I think there's a lot of Star Wars references that have been flying around since May the 4th. So, of course. Um, but yes, that's like one of the other interesting things is what about the two cold planets? And I think we have found some of those with Tess as well. Yeah, I think so too. Now, any, any signs of any exomoons? I'm not sure what our, our luck has been even in the Kepler sample. And I thought we might pick some up, but my guess is down in the noise, they get lost. But yeah, there's been a couple of papers on like what the sensitivity would be required and like what the signal would look like, but we haven't had any 100% definite exomoon detections yet. Hmm. Well, that'll be an exciting day when we, we get to see those. Um, so what what's next for you that you're excited about in the exoplanet realm? I know you want to see this data comparing to Kepler, but beyond TESS, are, are there any missions out on the horizon? Any other instruments coming online that you're, you're interested in? Um, yes, always. Um, I'm really <laughs> excited because um, TESS has been kind of the scout mission of trying to find small exoplanets around bright stars that other telescopes can look at. And one of the telescopes that we're interested in is the James Webb Space Telescope, which will hopefully be launching at the end of this year. And one of the reasons why is because planets at test finds that we then measure the mass for, we can start making some stabs in the dark as to the density of the planet and we want to then understand, okay, if this planet has an atmosphere, what is in that atmosphere? Because we know our atmosphere is super complicated and there's clouds, there's weather, there's ions floating around. What does an, ex an atmosphere in another exoplanet look like? And one of the many tools that James Webb is going to have is going to be an amazing ability to measure the light passing from a star through its planet atmosphere and reaching the telescope and give us that chemical fingerprint of that exoplanet's atmosphere. And we'll be able to start piecing together. Does it have nitrogen? Does it have carbon di dioxide? What, what's there? And we can look at that in much better detail than we have been in the past. Wow, well, thank you um, for that. That is super exciting. Fingers crossed about Webb getting up into orbit. It's been taking a really long time to launch it, but of course, we want to get it right. It's not going to a location it can be serviced, folks. So it's not like Hubble. Hubble, they made a mistake. They were able to fix it. This has to work correctly. Um, we were lucky to go down and view it. Uh, Griffith Observatory, we have some folks and friends that work down there. Our foundation uh, was a lot of folks and got to see it in person. It was pretty impressive. It's much bigger than you can you, you think it is. People working around with straps, holding cell phones out, taking pictures. And you think, oh, don't drop the cell phone. It's just... Um, but anyway, when it's up there, it's going to be amazing. And indeed, a lot of the targets Tess is finding, we're going to be able to sample those atmospheres and make measurements. And we, we're living in, a, in, in really a new time here with, you know, when I entered graduate school, we didn't know about very many exoplanets. One, it's showing that I'm getting old. But two, it's showing <laughs> the rapid rate at which we are discovering these exoplanets and the pace at which we are moving forward on this. So thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight, Natalia. Thank, thank you, you for our audience out there with all your great questions. We'll be back with more All Space Considered on the first Friday of the month next month. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>